All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Totally Baseless. It's been a couple weeks, been traveling around and uh, running all over God's green earth to watch baseball, basically. But we are back and we are with you today. I'm very, very, very pleased to introduce my guest today. He was a right-handed reliever, played for six seasons in MLB for the Giants, the Mets, and the Pirates. He's also the host of one of my favorite baseball podcasts out there, which is called In the Bullpen with Mark Dewey. So without further ado, here's Mark Dewey. Mark, how are you today? Thanks for joining us. I'm doing well, Chris. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. Um, home, catching up on some work, and i um, very, very pleased to have you here today. I can't say enough about your podcast, by the way. So if our listeners haven't heard it, uh, it's fantastic. If you want to talk about that for a second, how that came up. Sure. Actually, I was the pitching coordinator. I, I was a coach for the Brewers for eight years, pitching coordinator my last two years, and that ended after the 2019 season. And there was what was at the time a fairly small network called the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. I don't know. They had maybe five shows on the network, and they said, we'd really like to have a sports broadcast or podcast. And so some of my family looked at me and said, Dad, Dad, you know, get a hold of them, and and I did, and one thing led to another, and 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 I started it in 2020. So right wow. from the get go, I got to deal with COVID. No baseball's going on. <laughs> um, so that's how it got started, and have been doing it since I guess March of 2020. Well, it, it's great, and and that's kind of there's a parallel there because uh, Rocco Constantino and I had started Ball Nine, and immediately COVID hit and so we're like, okay now we have nothing to talk about so we kind of went into baseball history somewhat and that's kind of where we started and it kind of grew from there but i believe me i know the fact that we both made it through covid uh on the baseball side of things i think is a testament to uh to, to our love of the game because <laughs> there's always yes. something to talk about you know um, that's true so speaking of always something to talk about in your most recent episode you brought up some old versus new school um thoughts you had mentioned kevin kernan's article from last week with the kia generation um and we've all spoken about the pitching injuries that are going on ad infinitum at this point so i would like to get into that a little bit but not so much about the injuries themselves maybe you know, the more of the guys that I speak to, of course, they blame it on what starts in youth baseball and the chasing velo. But I wanted to get your thoughts on conditioning. Uh, you know, as a player and as a coach, it seems to me that some of the guys that I've spoken to, you know, they, they say players don't run anymore, so the legs are the first to go. I believe Jeff Nelson said that one to me. Um, you know, that it's all about the weighted ball now and chasing velo. So I wanted to get your thoughts on on the conditioning aspect of of pitching nowadays because you've seen it from both sides as a player and as a coach and as a pitching coordinator so i guess that's three sides <laughs> yeah that's a boy it's a very big question I, I will say this um when i was a player i almost essentially conditioned myself out of the game in other words i did too much huh. And so it, I came very close to ending my career. As a matter of fact, I was basically a 4A player. Like, I was going up and down with the Mets in 1992, yeah. and it was basically because I couldn't consistently perform on the mound, and that was fundamentally the result of over-conditioning. And I, it, so it was, I had to back off, and once I did, now I was able to actually take good stuff out to the mound on a regular basis. So you have to be, you have to be wary of that. That was my problem, and, and thankfully I got over it, uh, you know, soon enough to actually have a major league career. However, I, I do think that a lot of time is spent inside. A lot of time is spent doing, you know, three sets of ten, whatever it might be. I don't think enough time is spent outside. I don't mm -hmm. think enough time is spent uh, dealing with things like gravity, inertia, momentum, ground reaction forces, all the stuff that takes place when you're running around. Right. Yeah. You, know, you think about Mariano Rivera, you know, back when he blew out his knee on what I think was going to be his final season, power shagging. I was so happy that the Yankees didn't say, hey, you can't do that next year. Right. I think right. that's part of I mean, obviously Mariano Rivera is one of the all time greats. Sure. But I think a part of that was that routine that he had. He was being athletic. Yeah. Right. 
And I think we've removed that. I had a pitching coach. He's been in the game forever. Jeff Morris. He's a scout now with, I don't know who he's a scout with. Maybe the Reds. Okay. My first two seasons, he was my pitching coach. He had played a little bit of pro ball. And my first full season in Clinton, Iowa, at that time, pitcher shagged. Sure. I would say maybe a little too much. A lot of times we'd stand in spring training for two and a half hours. <laughs> but I used to I used to literally lay out. I mean, dive for balls. And Jeff Morris came up to me, Mo, and he says, man, I love that. You keep doing that. If I did that today, oh, yeah. I would get pulled into the office and hammered. <laughs> so, again, all of this, you know, and I talked about it a little bit even for the, for the youth. I, I, I really think, and that goes back to Kevin Kernan's article, not the most recent one, but the one on the yeah. bubble wrap, we're trying to be so protective of people that I believe we're actually enhancing the likelihood they're going to get injured. Yes, Mariano might blow out sh- power shagging. I could have possibly dove for a ball and broke my wrist. Yeah, I get that. Yeah, But I think to try to eliminate all of those possible things that could go wrong actually enhances the likelihood somebody's going to get hurt. See, I could not agree more with that. And and like you said, it's not that Mariano ever – he didn't really get hurt while pitching. Like you said, he was shagging. And that's something, you know, people – that was really the only major injury that I remember him having. But he was doing baseball things. And is yes. that something that we're not seeing anymore? Now, you know, th- there are between innings limits and pitch counts and and – and again, the bubble wrap is there. They're worried about over usage, but are are some of these pitchers being underused and underutilized to stretch them out? I mean, it's like, what does that do to an arm if they're not throwing enough? I talked to a guy like Louis Tion, and he would just throw and throw and throw, and he's going out there and throwing two hundred pitches in a game against Nolan Ryan. Um, what do you see as, is there a happy medium? And do you think baseball will get back to that at some point where they realize that maybe the coddling and maybe the bubble wrapping of these guys <clears throat> is not exactly the answer because it's not working. Yes. And and maybe that was your original intent on conditioning Yeah, is conditioning the arm. And I, I, I do believe that we have coddled and or, and or put false restraints on pitchers. Well, yeah. first of all, you have to understand, pitchers are different, right? I remember Tom Seaver saying something about, sure. yeah, Nolan Ryan and I both had pitch counts. Mine was about 135, and his was about 145, mm-hmm. right? And it wasn't, oh, we're coming to get you because you've hit a magical number, but they both, that was when they started decreasing in their stuff. So you have to understand, there are guys, I played with a guy, Terry Mulholland. Sure. Terry... Terry could could throw eight innings today and be ready to go in the bullpen tomorrow. So you gotta you gotta take the reins off a guy like him. And and it and it varies from person to person. But overall, we are not allowing guys in the minor leagues, A, to throw enough pitches, and B, to try to work themselves out of situations. That's I remember when I yeah, when I first got into coaching, it was with the Mets. So I'd have been out of the game, I guess, three or four years. This was in 2000. I'm at a spring training game. I'm watching the game, just, you know, seeing what's going on. And then, you know, there's bases loaded and one out or two outs or whatever. And all of a sudden I hear, roll it. And I'm looking around and everybody's running off the field. I'm going, what's going on? Well, back then they started this thing where if a guy got to a certain number of pitches, you would just roll the inning. You'd come off. Wow. Well, In a way, that makes some sense, right? You're trying to build up that arm strength. You're trying to get them in shape. However, that has now gone to roll it in the middle of a season, in the middle of a game, whereas you never let a guy try to work out of a jam. When I was with the Brewers, Steve Carse was the bullpen coach. And he was talking about when he was in Oakland with La Russa, La Russa said, the first jam is on you. You're going to have to figure out how to work through it. The second jam, I'm probably going to come and get you. But he, he basically said, you better expect to work through this first jam. So I think we're limiting the number of pitches. We're not allowing guys to throw enough pitches, in my opinion, especially starters. Right. And then also we're limiting letting them work through difficult situations. Letting them, hey, you got bases loaded and one out. What do you got for me here? Yeah, I know it might be the seventh inning. Maybe you've thrown 105 pitches. Can you figure out how to get out of this? 
I think both of those things are hurting as it regards developing pitchers. How important is that to a pitcher mentally to know that you can get out of that situation? Does that, does that give you just an adrenaline boost? Does it, I mean, what does that do for a pitcher's confidence? It's got to it's got to be a great boost to know. Okay, I can do this. I got out of this. If they're taking you out at the first sign of adversity, that can't mentally be good for you out there on the mound. It's not, and I think it went it went from they didn't take you out, and the pitcher didn't want to be taken out, to they started taking you out in those situations, and the pitcher got upset about it. To now, as a pitcher, I expect to be taken out in that situation. I think we've made that regression, not a progression, a regression. So, again, I'm not that old. I'm 60, but I'm I'm the older generation. I didn't ever want to be taken out of a game, period, no matter what the situation was. I I was getting my teeth kicked in. I still figured I'll figure out how to get somebody out. Now, a lot of times I didn't, (laughs) but I wanted to, (laughs) Um, you know. And, and again, it's in one sense, it's not hugely new. <clears throat> one of my former pitching coaches, Dick Pohl, oh, was yeah. the pitching coach in Cincinnati <clears throat> when I was done playing. And I went to visit. Dusty was managing, and Dick was the pitching coach. And I had them both in San Francisco. And I went to Cincinnati and was chit-chatting with them and sitting in the office with Dick Pohl. And he was telling me the story of a starting pitcher who knew that if he went five innings per start and made 32, 33 starts a year, he was going to get paid good money, and it wasn't really worthwhile to go six or seven innings. And then Dick told me a story of a pitcher that he said, I would ask him, hey, how are you doing? Are you good to go another inning? And the pitcher would say, well, how many pitches do I have? Ooh. And Dick said, I can't remember the number, but Dick said, if I said anything over 90, he said, oh, I'm, I'm done. So Dick, being the wily veteran pitching coach he was, always lied to him. <laughs> oh, you're at 82, <laughs> right? So that's, that's a veteran that mindset. Move. That is a better move. So that that mindset is not like it just started yesterday. This was good. Yeah. Uh, this is probably 15 years ago I had this conversation yeah. with Dick. But now it's there in spades. So now it's almost everybody's expectation that if I get myself in a jam, if I hit 90 or 95 pitches, if I'm getting to the third time through the lineup, come get me. Yeah, and, and let the bullpen figure it out. It, it seems yes. – and there is an over-reliance, I believe, on, on the bullpens these days – you're seeing pens. There could be a team with a great bullpen. I'll use the Yankees as an example. They usually have a pretty solid group of guys in there. And if you have these guys just, just throwing four or five innings, these guys are taxed by July. Do you see in this day and age of pitch counts, just these guys being stretched out longer? Do you see guys that maybe can throw 120? Cause of course you have guys like Cole and a healthy Verlander. And these guys are kind of the last of the old guard who will go out there and give you 115, 120 a game. But do you see, is that is that day over? And do you think we'll ever get back to seeing guys go out there and be in horses again? Yeah. Well, of course, I would like to see it happen. Yeah. I would see it happening if, <clears throat> if we drew the conclusion that I think is right, and I might be wrong. I just think it's very difficult to, to win a World Series – when you get into October with a bullpen that's been overused and then continue to overuse them in the postseason, I think that if somebody draws the conclusion, you know what, to have our starting pitchers go longer, deeper into the games, and that may include throwing more pitches, you know, we've kind of capped them at 100 or so, maybe it's 110 or 120, that that is actually more conducive not only to winning and getting to the postseason – but it's more conducive once we're in the postseason to winning a World Series. If somebody draws that conclusion, then then maybe things would change. I'm just not sure that anybody's going to be given the opportunity to draw that conclusion. That I don't know. Right. And getting back to the bullpen, I mean, if your starter's coming out after five and you need to use four relievers a day, you're counting on all of those guys having a good day. And that's not going to happen all the time. And and that's something that's really rolling the dice, if you ask me. It it is when we're talking about the numbers and the data and the analytics and all of that. It, it does seem just logically that if I have to use five pitchers to get through this game, statistically one of them is probably going to blow up on me. Right. Right. So if I can have the starter go seven instead of five, and now I only have to use two pitchers, now I only have to have three guys that are fairly successful in today's game to win, as opposed to five guys in tomorrow's game. 
again, the, the numbers would seem to indicate that. And I would assume somebody knows if that's the case. In other words, I'm sure somebody's got those numbers. Oh, absolutely. But I haven't seen them. Yeah, that, that one they keep under wraps, apparently. But it, it, and, and especially with the three batter minimum then. So if a guy comes on, he's, he doesn't have it. He walks the bases loaded. Now you're asking another guy to come in with bases loaded, no outs, and hope that he has it together. It's just – it's it's a recipe for disaster, I, I personally think. But what do I know? I, I, have, I have the same view. Well, good. Okay, see, that's good. Now I don't feel so bad. But <laughs> – Well, you got me on your side, right? Now you're all yeah, set. Yeah, no, perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, you know, again, this – well – we spoke about this very briefly before we started uh, the Paul Skeens situation in uh, the minors. I believe he's in Indianapolis for uh, and the Pirates minor league system. He, he struck out something like 28, 29 guys in like 12 innings or something. I mean, it was something ridiculous. Now they're, they're taking him out after three innings. I don't know if this is a service time thing just to kind of keep him warm until they can pull him up, uh, you know, in the beginning of May. All I know is that they're letting him throw 103 miles an hour and they're yanking him after three innings. I don't know if that's also a recipe for disaster or not, but what do you see happening there? Because I'm sure you've you've watched this. The kid's a great talent. I think he's going to have a great career. If they want him as a starter and they're, they're capping him at three innings in the minors, how do you see that playing out once they call him up? Is this an injury waiting to happen or is he just an athletic freak? I'm uh, just curious as to your thoughts on the Skeens situation. Well, he very well, very well may be an athletic freak. Yeah. But unless they plan on using him out of the pen, or at least using him out of the pen, let's say, for this year, getting his feet wet in the big leagues in the pen, if they actually plan on calling him up, which I'm assuming they, they do sometime in the next month or so, and making him a starting pitcher, only one of two things are, are an option. He's going to go three or four innings, and then, again, we get back to the your bullpens being yeah. taxed, or they're going to try to stretch him out. I don't think that you stretch a guy out for the first time. And it won't be the first time in his career, but for the first time this year in the big leagues, I think you ought to, if anything, you ought to, you ought to push a guy a little bit further in the minor leagues. Cause when you get into a big league ballpark and you have the third deck and you have everything going on, adrenaline adds two things. Yeah. So a hundred pitches, let's just say a hundred pitches in triple a is for most people, not the same thing as a hundred pitches in the big leagues. Right. The 100 pitches in the big leagues for most guys is going to be more stressful than 100 pitches in AAA. I've seen a lot of people defending what the Pirates are doing. and But, see, my argument would be exactly what you just said. It, there's a huge, huge leap from NCAA, now he's in AAA. I mean, that that's an astronomical leap. But, I mean, but people don't really <laughs> seem to understand the difference between triple a and the majors I, I think i think a lot of fans especially some younger fans really think it's just kind of mlb light so i've spoken to enough guys that i know there's a massive difference between talent and everything between triple a and in and, and the majors but if you could get into that a little bit uh, on just how big of a gap that is for a player okay i would say two things one looking at it more from the mental side and then the, the other are looking at it more from the physical side so from the mental side, again, it goes back to if I'm in AAA in, in Indianapolis, as Skeens sure. is, or anywhere else, I don't have that third deck. I don't have the pressure of this is a big league game and winning and losing a big league game can make a difference of making the postseason or not. I don't have to worry necessarily if I'm Paul Skeens, I might, but if I'm if I'm just Mark Dewey in AAA – and I come in tonight and give up, a, you know, I come in to save a game, and instead I give up a home run and lose the game. It's not going to be plastered in my day all over Sports Center today, all over any form, any number of media forms, including including social media. I get to the big leagues, that's there. I just give you an example. I've heard a lot of people through through a long for many years say so and so is dominating in the seventh and eighth inning. And he's dominating the same kinds of guys he'd be facing in the ninth inning. He's facing the heart of the order in the seventh inning. Therefore, he can be a closer. No, mm -hmm. not necessarily. Because there's a difference in coming in in the seventh inning. There's nobody behind you when you're the closer. So I can I have less pressure, and some people can't handle that pressure, right? Same thing from AAA to the big leagues. 
right. to dominate in the minor leagues doesn't necessarily equate to dominating in the big leagues because of that pressure. So that's the mental side. The physical side is that more mistakes, if I'm a pitcher, I can make more mistakes in the minor leagues, even AAA, and get away with them than in the big leagues. Mistakes that are that are popped up, grounded out, swung and missed, in the big leagues, a lot of times are tattooed. Yeah. And so I can have success because there's there are more holes in the lineup, there are more holes in the swings. There are guys who are really, really good AAA players that don't do very well in the big leagues because as a hitter, they're great at hitting the mistakes and they don't see those mistakes in the big leagues from pitchers. Or as a pitcher, their stuff is good enough that at that level, guys don't get to it. When you get to the big leagues, they're going to get to it, at least historically. They're going to get to some pitches that they don't get to in AAA. A perfect explanation. If you hang one in, in the big leagues, it's, it's going a long way. As a rule, yes. Well, we're at the point where I normally like to start the pitch clock on you guys. I know you've heard uh, a couple of these before. Um, I'm going to start asking a couple questions. Um, are you ready? You want to uh, give this a shot? <laughs> I'll give it a shot. I'll do the best I can. We'll give it a shot. It's, it's you know, the magic of editing. It's great. Maybe, you know, it's fun. Um, okay, so, as usual, I like to do the, the favorite post-game spread. If you don't remember the exact spread, then, you know, maybe something in that city will go with. But I'm going to give you five cities. This is the food section. People love this because uh, people love baseball and people love to eat. So, without further ado, here we go. First one would be New York. We'll start off with an easy one. That is an easy one. I don't remember the details of the food. Obviously, I was in New York for a time as a home player, but I'll look at it when I was a visitor, so when I was with the Giants and the and the Pirates. New York was one of those cities in which you looked forward to the spread after the game. You knew, generally speaking, you were going to get something good to eat, something you would yeah. enjoy eating. So that was one of those cities that when you went into that city, you were like, okay, post game's going to be pretty good here. All right, so we'll give them we'll give them a check instead of an X. Uh, we will now we'll move a little further south down the uh, down the turnpike down ninety five and go to Philadelphia. Whew. that's something I'm having a harder time remembering because you, what I remember most about Philadelphia is the fans, right? Oh, I, yeah. I, so so Philadelphia, and I've told people going back to New York. In New York, the fans will ride you, but they're just having a good time. In Philadelphia, they actually hate you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I guess my memories of Philadelphia are less about the post-game spread and more about. You know, I remember with the Giants. You know, Rod Beck was, in my opinion, probably the best closer in the National League for oh, several sure. years in the night. Sure, absolutely. And I remember listening to the Phillies fans. You would have thought that he was Adolf Hitler or something. I mean, they were just on him so hard. So I apologize. I can't remember the post game spread. I, I we will put that down to to a uh, to a shell shock type thing here. <laughs> <laughs> how about how about uh, you had mentioned the Reds? Let's go Cincinnati. How about that? Yes, um, I would say Cincinnati would be below New York for sure. There's one city I don't know if you'll hit it that I remember probably would be top on the bed, Ooh, on the spread. Okay. I would say Cincinnati would probably be um, fine, but not as good as New York. So, you know, it wasn't something you were going to grumble and complain about. It wasn't something you were going to call home about either. Fair enough. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll get a check. Um, how about Houston? Wait, they were an American League team at that time, weren't they? No, they were in When I played, they were, were they still in the National League. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so again, we're going back. It's been almost 30 years since yeah. my last uh, season in the big leagues. So we're going back a ways on Houston. Again, nothing that, that s sticks out to me. Uh, there's, really? you know, again, well, I definitely, they... no matter what city you pick, I'm not going to remember what the spread was. Yeah, yeah. But nothing, like Cincinnati, nothing nothing sticks out as, oh, that's terrible or that's great. It, Interesting. It was, thought, it was I what, thought... what I will say this. I will say this. When I was coaching, legitimately at lower levels of minor league baseball the spreads were better than any triple-a spread i had and oftentimes were at least as good as some of the big league spread i had wow so when you go from the from 1990 to 96 when i was in the big leagues 
to let's say 2014 to 2019 when I was traveling around as an assistant coordinator or coordinator, that's how much better even at the minor league level spreads got. We didn't have a spread until we got to AAA when I was right. in the minor leagues. Yeah. Now you're at low A ball or even a rookie ball team, and you're going, man, this this spread is this is on par with some of the spreads I had in the big leagues. Wow. Okay. See, I didn't know that. See, that's, I'm learning things here. That's that's the important part. That's really the important. Yeah, I'm forgetting well, things, and hopefully you're learning things. Yeah, see, that's just perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, let's go last but not least. And I don't know if this is the city that you were talking about, but how about St. Louis? St. Louis. I, I, do, I do remember this. Saint, yeah, St. Louis, as it regards everything, was probably the best. So I wouldn't say they had the best post-game spread, but it was good. But as far as when you walked in the clubhouse, anytime, if you want to get there at 10 in the morning for a night game or 2 in the afternoon, whatever the case may be, whether it's before the game, after BP and before the game, after the game, you are covered as it regards eating in St. Louis. Excellent. Well, um, now I kind of have to ask as a little bonus question, which city were you hoping that I got to that I did not? In my opinion, the city that had the best spreads was San Diego. Really? That's what I can remember, again, back in the 90s, that San Diego typically was the place in which they had really good food on a regular basis. In some cities, you might have, let's say you're there for a four-game series, you might have three very mediocre days, and then on getaway day, you got a really good spread because that's when, at that time, you actually paid clubhouse dues. All right? They don't do that anymore. So, so <laughs> before you're going to walk out the door and write that check, they get you. But I remember San Diego pretty much. If you were there four days, days one through four, very good, very good spread. Interesting, and no one has ever said that one before. So that's again good to know, and I just learned something. Well, listen, <laughs> we are. Uh... <laughs> oh man, every time I do that, I get hungry. So anyway. Uh, I do want to say thank you to our guest, Mark Dewey, today. That was great. Uh, Mark, thank you so much for coming on. That was fantastic. I think I appreciate you having me on, Chris. Absolutely. Anytime you want to come on and talk some shop, door's always open. Um, thank you. Sure. As I said, Mark Dewey was with us today. And if you have not checked out In the Bullpen with Mark Dewey, uh, do yourself a favor and check that out. It's available everywhere. Uh, it's a great Great, great insight. I love that Robin Yount quote that you play all the time. That's right. Don't don't ever think this game is all about you. Never. <laughs> yeah, it's great. So once again, I want to say thank you to Mark Dewey. I want to say thank you to all of you for listening to Totally Baseless. And uh, I am Chris Vitale. Do that whole thing where you like, subscribe, and all that. You know the drill. Uh, once again, Mark, thank you. And um, Thank you, Chris. We will, ch we will catch you next time here on Totally Baseless. Until then, adios, muchachos. Bye.